Tonight, a sixth Meninja cockle case in less than a month confirmed in Tasmania South. Also tonight, a disease that killed more than a million farmed salmon in Macquarie Harbour strikes again, this time in salmon leases off Bruny Island. A renewed push for the Mount Wellington cable car proposal. The claims of secrecy surrounding the project remain. And accusations of tokenism as the AFL shortens the season of the Women's League. Good evening. For the final time, this is ABC News with Peter G. And a welcome to our viewers on the News Channel tonight. Another case of meningococcal disease has been confirmed in Tasmania, the sixth in just three weeks. A 66-year-old man is being treated in the Royal Hobart Hospital. Carla Howarth joins us from there now. Carla, what do we know about this man's condition? Peter, the 66-year-old man was admitted to the Royal Hobart Hospital last night. He's now in a stable condition. Authorities confirmed this afternoon that he had contracted the Y strain of meningococcal disease. It's the first case of the Y strain to occur in Tasmania this year. Now, five out of the six meningococcal cases this year have occurred in Hobart's northern suburbs, and authorities say three of those have been the W strain. When we see an increase in cases, it probably means it's being, it's being spread more, quick, more frequently amongst people in the community. Uh, and that's what gives rise to localised clusters of cases. Is demand increasing now, Carla, for the meningococcal vaccines? Peter, since a 16-year-old girl died from meningococcal disease three weeks ago, pharmacists have been reporting a large influx in the number of people wanting the vaccination. Now, the state government has extended the free ACWI vaccination program to a wider age group and Public Health is holding a free vaccination clinic at the Derwent Entertainment Centre this weekend. But out of the 2,000 spots available, they have all booked out. Carla Howarth reporting from Central Hobart. A disease which killed more than a million farmed fish in Macquarie Harbour earlier this year has struck Hewan Aquaculture's leases in southern Tasmania. The company has applied to transfer salmon from Storm Bay to Norfolk Bay to prevent the disease from spreading. But questions are being asked about the urgency of the move. Storm Bay in Tasmania's southeast is a beacon of hope for the salmon industry, with all three of the state's producers hoping to expand there in coming years. Hewan Aquaculture already farms in Storm Bay, but some of their fish have contracted a deadly virus known as POMV. The company won't say how many of its salmon the virus has killed. I'm sorry, with the line of question, I'm not in a position to answer the numbers specifically, and we certainly don't have a lot of dead fish at the bottom of the pens. Hewan has applied for state government approval to move fish out of Storm Bay to reduce the risk of the disease spreading. The new site is 450 metres offshore at Norfolk Bay. Reducing that risk by having an alternative harbour site rather than bringing those fish that have had been infected back to where fish are that haven't been infected. But questions are being asked about the urgency of the move with operations at the Norfolk lease due to start in two weeks and continue through until the end of November. Will they be coming into Norfolk Bay permanently? What does it mean with the diseased fish? What environmental impact will it have? Certainly there's a lot of concerns, a lot of questions being asked. Environment groups are asking about potential brand damage from the industry's massive expansion plans in southern Tasmania. Poorly governed, um, no disclosure of escapes, no disclosure of mass kills related to disease and no credible science done on the risk of transfer to wild species. Rival company Tassel have leases south of Norfolk Bay at Newbina, but don't believe Hewan's plans will pose a risk to their operations. Leon Compton, ABC News. The health of the Tamer River has taken a hit, with authorities partly blaming the 2016 Launceston floods. The latest report card by Natural Resource Management shows all sections of the river except one have deteriorated in the past two years. The agency says the Tamer is still recovering from pollutants that washed into the system during the floods, but other factors are also at play. 
In Zone 1, which is the Launceston to Lagana area, we know the area is heavily impacted by inputs from sewage treatment plants and the flows from the catchment coming from the north and south Esk rivers, and so it concentrates a lot of pollutants into that zone. Earlier this year, the state and federal governments promised $95 million to improve the river's health and upgrade infrastructure. There appears to be renewed momentum behind the Mount Wellington cable car project after its plans for a base station were rejected by the owners of Cascade Brewery. Swiss engineers who designed the project are flying into Hobart this weekend to examine sites and address concerns about the project. But claims of secrecy surrounding the project remain, with an application from the company due to go before a closed council meeting next week. It's been over a month since Carlton United Brewery said no to a cable car based at its Cascade site. Speculation that the base station for the project could be the rubbish tip at South Hobart has been rejected by the proponents, but they weren't willing to be interviewed today. We don't know where the base is, we don't know what the route is, and we don't know what they're going to build on top of the organ pipes, and that's the bit that matters most. But more may be revealed soon. Engineers from Switzerland who helped design the project for the Mount Wellington Cableway Company will arrive in Tasmania on Sunday. They'll be examining sites and responding to questions, including how the cable car would cope in strong winds. Our government is supported, uh, as a supporter of a, a cable car on Mount Wellington. But it will be the Hobart City Council, not the government, considering the latest application from the Cableway Company. The company's made a submission to the Council's Parks and Recreation Committee, which is believed to relate to the acquisition of land. At the moment, that agenda item will be discussed in a closed meeting next Thursday. The public, the, the councillors, everybody would prefer if this project was uh, put forward, put forward in public, uh, in an open way, no more secret meetings, no more special deals. The company says it's following procedure. I've spoken to the general manager this morning. My understanding that he's still yet to complete the report and he's actually advised me that he's not sure whether it's going to go to an open or a closed council uh, committee. I won't be interfering uh, with that and I'm not aware of the details of or any proposed changes. This is a, a major issue confronting the Hobart City Council. Uh, we're heading into uh, local government elections. Uh, this is, is an issue of intense uh, public interest. The cable car project continues to divide and that's before a development application has even been lodged. Fiona Blackwood, ABC News. Hay growers in northwest Queensland can't keep up with demand from drought affected farmers searching for feed to keep their stock alive. With supplies running out, prices for hay in some cases have trebled. This hay being cut in Hewenden will be a lifeline to desperate farmers across the country. I've had phone calls from Albury and Cunnamulla and out in the Territory. It's just so scarce that people are willing to put more freight on the product and send it further. Jeff Reid's sheds are normally full at this time of year, but there's now a very long waiting list for his hay. With supplies non-existent in New South Wales and rapidly diminishing in Victoria, many farmers are willing to pay to keep their stock alive. Jeff Reid has a fixed price for his bales, but says not every fodder producer is as scrupulous. You know, that people put the price up on an order that's already there, just say, oh no, sorry, the price has gone up, which is a bit hard to swallow because that person's in a bit of stress and finally got a supply and then get told the price has gone up. I've heard stories of four or five hundred dollars a tonne, you know, it's bloody ridiculous. Six months ago, hay stockpiles were at an all-time high and prices low. But the drought has chewed through that buffer. Really specific products like loose and hay, yes, the, the, prices, the prices have tripled. Um, and, um, but they, they've come off relatively low bases as well. Farmers are hoping spring rain will provide some relief, but with predictions dry conditions will persist until at least October, North Queensland hay producers will be the saviour for some time to come. The next crop has just been planted. It's not long, hopefully in another month it'll be up and away and growing and we can start producing again. We're working on supply from, uh, from new areas um, all the time and so there may be a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. The Prime Minister's also given more hope to drought-stricken farmers in eastern states. It is a diabolical time and I, I just want to thank everybody that is providing support. Farmers need our support and we are providing that and we'll be providing more. Those more difficult decisions like completely destocking, 
thinking about off-farm income, etc., becoming more relevant and real for a lot of producers at the moment. Hard choices ahead for many as the drought drags on. David Chen, ABC News, Hewenden. If you'd like to find out how you can help, go to the ABC's website, abc.net.au slash drought. You'll find a list of charities that are assisting farmers and full coverage of this issue. A major showdown's looming at the International Whaling Commission. The chair of the IWC, who used to be Japan's chief whaling negotiator, has told the ABC the organisation cannot continue on the same path of dispute and deadlock between pro- and anti-whaling countries. But Australia's Environment Minister says he'll oppose any moves that would make it easier to kill whales. North Asia correspondent Jake Sturmer reports from Tokyo. To some, this is a scientific process needed to better manage our use of whales. To others, it's slaughter. Last year, fishermen harpooned 333 Antarctic minke whales, 122 of which were pregnant. Japan says it's needed to understand how many whales are out there. Humans are on top of the food chain. We eat living creatures with gratitude and by properly managing the resources. I believe it's a path we should take regarding animals and plants, including whales. Disagreement on issues such as this has brought the International Whaling Commission to deadlock. Japan's fisheries agency claims 40 of the 88 countries at the IWC support their position, but decisions can't be passed without the backing of a three-quarter majority. Tokyo wants to change that to a simple majority of 45. Something has to give, according to the IWC's chair. The only way in my mind to break this deadlock or break this situation is to change the paradigm again. What the two sides are in disagreement over is the fundamental purpose of the IWC. Whether it should manage how the international community uses whales or whether the organisation should be doing more to protect them. Forget the clashes at sea. The showdown in September between pro and anti-whaling countries appears set to define the future of the International Whaling Commission. Jake Sturmer, ABC News, Tokyo. A century after a tree was planted in memory of Tasmanians lost in World War I, the final tree has been planted on Hobart Soldiers Memorial Avenue. The avenue now pays tribute to 520 Tasmanians killed in the war. None of these men ever came back, right? The trees stood for the graves they could never visit. We always came up on Anzac Day and we also came on Regatta Day because my granddad's number 84, which is right down the bottom of the avenue and yeah but there wasn't really a lot said um, but it was always kind of a, a sadness. There's a commitment from all levels of government to preserve the avenue as a living memorial to the dead. Zimbabwe's incumbent leader Emerson Manangagwa has officially won the presidential election with just over half the votes. But opposition supporters have refused to accept the result and say the poll was rigged. The accusation sparked deadly clashes on the streets of Harare. On the streets of Harare there's a fragile calm. Police and soldiers have cleared the capital in the wake of the election violence, ordering shops to shut and sending people home. But it could all erupt again with news that President Emerson Manangagwa has been declared the winner of Monday's election. The votes received by Manangagwa Emerson Dambuzo of ZANU PF party are more than half the number of votes cast in the presidential election. Opposition supporters reject the result, accusing the government of rigging the poll. Their protests on Wednesday led to a brutal crackdown by soldiers and police wielding guns and bayonets. The government blames the opposition for the violence that left several people dead, but the opposition leader says his supporters were unarmed. Our people are peace-loving. We've demonstrated several times, and we are peace-loving people. Zimbabweans love peace but they have a very violent government. In the wake of the clashes, police have stormed the opposition headquarters, arresting 16 people and seizing documents. Hours later, a tense standoff continued. Dozens of party supporters remain inside, refusing to come out. <laughs> President Manangagwa has appealed for calm. 
On Twitter, he says he's humbled by his win and adds, though we may have been divided at the polls, we are united in our dreams. But for many Zimbabweans who'd longed for truly democratic change, it's just a new face on the same dictatorial regime. The country remains as divided as ever. Anne Barker, ABC News. An Australian soldier has been rescued after being trapped in sub-zero conditions on a mountain in New Zealand. Lieutenant Terry Harch arrived at a hospital in Dunedin this afternoon. He'd been stranded on Mount Aspiring on New Zealand's South Island since a severe snowstorm hit the area last weekend. His rescuers say he's done incredibly well to stay alive. When we got to him last night, uh, he was in much better condition than we had anticipated that he would be. Um, and he obviously did very good work in, in protecting himself in very bad conditions. Four rescuers spent last night with him on the mountain, providing food, clothes and medical treatment. He's said to be in a reasonable condition, suffering minor frostbite. To finance now and ongoing trade war concerns continue to undermine investor confidence. On the other hand, the latest numbers show consumers are undeterred. Here's Philip Lasker. Trade wars, rising petrol costs, falling house prices, low wages growth. Water off a duck's back. Consumers are still spending. Retail sales, which account for about a third of household outlays, were quite good in June and not too bad for the quarter. That'll help the GDP picture. And this is where the money went during the month. Two groups, which have experienced some very tough times, clothing and footwear and department stores, topped the list. Household goods might have been a casualty of the property slowdown. But it's worth remembering that discounting continues to play a big part in driving sales. The price deflator, that's essentially prices, is lower, and that's helping lift volumes. Not to mention households are saving less to support their lifestyles. This is where you see the trade war concerns. Investors are bracing for the next instalment, so they're not doing much. It's the same wait and see story here. The market was flat. The bank suffered after the Productivity Commission concluded the big four lenders are too powerful. Then we had Treasurer Scott Morrison calling for more competition in the market. It's official, Apple is worth a trillion US dollars. The stock gained almost 3% to $207 a share after strong third quarter results. And if you squint, you'll see Australia's biggest company, the CBA. But at $1 trillion, Apple is not as highly valued as it used to be. It used to be valued at multiples much higher than the broader market. Not anymore. The Australian dollar has picked up recently. It's above 73 and a half US cents, and that's finance. The Australian women's soccer team has fallen just short of a successful defence of its Tournament of Nations trophy in the United States. In warm conditions, Australia dominated the second half of its match against Japan. The 2-0 result saw the Matildas finished equal on points with the Americans, but the hosts claimed the competition after finishing with a superior goal difference. After conceding an early own goal, the world's top-ranked side proved far too strong for Brazil, with the 4-1 victory securing the US the Tournament of Nations title. Outraged AFLW players say the AFL's not serious about the women's game if mooted changes to the next season go ahead. The AFLW boss says no decision has been made yet, but there's a business case to keep the season to the same length. National Sport correspondent Mary Guerin reports. Expanding the women's game from eight teams to ten was supposed to be good news and just reward for the phenomenal first two seasons. Now there are suggestions the enlarged competition will still play over eight weeks, just six home and away rounds and two weeks of finals, meaning not all teams would play each other. My concern is that by um, doing what they're proposing, that their um, efforts to further the game and the growth of the game perhaps seem ingenuine. It sparked outrage from dozens of players on social media, pointing out the sacrifices in time and pay they already make to raise the level of the AFLW, joined by one of the biggest names in the game. We wear that expectation that this is going to be a professional elite competition when, in reality, this is a gimmicky tournament. <laughs> 
I know that there's a lot of emotion that surrounds women's football, but the AFL is, is dedicated to it and it's committed to make sure that this is sustainable. The AFLW boss insists it's not a done deal yet, but managing player workload, the crowded broadcast market and commercial realities have put the option on the table. And some of the data does show us that as the season progresses, it does start to drop away in terms of attendances and also audiences. So we do need to make sure that it's a strong product on offer. Erin Hoare, who's joined the new Geelong team, is worried about the signal the move would send to younger players. That might deter them from choosing footy um, because for them they might see that this is um, perhaps a less of a or a, or a longer term um, pathway to having a fully professional sport compared to other sports. It's our job to make sure that the foundations are really strong so that we're not just thinking about what it looks like in 2019, we're actually thinking aspirationally what it looks like in 2030 and 2040. A committee will meet next Tuesday to make a fixture recommendation to be approved by the AFL Commission. The debate is not likely to end there with four more new teams in 2020. Mary Geeran, ABC News, Melbourne. Phil Sydney sent in tonight's weather photo of sunrise over Hobart. Here's Simon McCulloch. Good evening. Lots of high level cloud across the state today, but not much rain till a rain band pushed in from the northwest during the late afternoon. Maximum temperatures, in fact, were above average about the west and south, close to average elsewhere. The state's high is 17 at Hobart, Strawn, and Grove, and overnight temperatures close to average down to minus two at Fingal. Hobart's range was 5 to 17, Launceston 1 to 14, and 14 the top for Burnie and Devonport. Rainfall tonight, Am, just some patchy light falls about the northeast. There was a couple of millimetres at Mount Barrow, but that was the only significant total. On the satellite sequence, you can see all that high level cloud covering the state for much of the day, not producing rain until towards the rear of that band. We started to see a bit of rain pushing in from the northwest. Another front back in here is set to cross the state tomorrow afternoon and evening. So on the chart, the first of those fronts are clearing away tomorrow morning and then this second front approaching during the day. So some early showers contracting to the west, south and northeast and clearing, then some rain to develop ahead of that next front in the northwest and starting to extend throughout by the end of the day. This deep low stays to the west of us on Sunday with a gusty northwest to northerly flow and some more rain, although very little in the southeast. And this low will pass to the south of the state on Monday, bringing a westerly change and some more rain once again. Interstate for tomorrow and uh, a windy day in Adelaide. Showers easing in Perth, but fine for the other capitals. Tasmania's forecast early showers contracting to the west, south, and northeast, and then see some rain developing in the northwest in the afternoon. We'll start to see some of that rain pushing into the east and southeast towards midnight. So some showers for Strawn tomorrow. Can expect rain at times for Burnie and Devonport and 13. Rain at times for Launceston, 5 to 13. Some light rain for St Helens and Swansea. But for Hobart, it should be fine and partly cloudy and a range of 7 to 16. Sunrise tomorrow is at 18 minutes past 7. Coastal waters, west to northwesterly winds, 15 to 25 knots, reaching 30 knots in the northeast. Shifting more northerly during the afternoon and reaching 30 knots about the west. West to southwest swell up to three metres in the west and south, a westerly swell in Bass Strait and a southerly swell to two metres in the east. Strong warnings in place tomorrow for the west and north coast and there's a minor flood warning being issued for the North Esk River. On Sunday, a northwesterly flow with a low to the west, some rain less likely in the southeast, with rain for Burnie, rain increasing for Devonport and Launceston, and possible late rain for Hobart. And then on Monday, that low passes to the south with some rain again contracting to the west and north later in the day. Some rain for Burnie, Devonport and Launceston, and rain at times for Hobart. So, uh, Peter? Uh, for the last time, we're about to cross back to you. It's been a privilege to work with you for the last 13 years. Really enjoyed it, particularly your sense of humour, and uh, re really enjoyed that along the way. So for the last time, that's tonight's weather. Here's Peter, and we go back to the desk, where he's joined by Angela Ross. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Well, Pete, we can't quite believe that you're leaving us after 20 years at the news desk and 38 years at the ABC. There's no doubt the Peter G show will be sorely <laughs> missed by our viewers, but you'll be missed more by your newsroom colleagues. It just won't be the same without your warmth, humour, guidance and, of course, your sports insights. Personally, I'll miss hearing you break into song at any given moment. Not now. <laughs> We've prepared some highlights of your remarkable on-air career in sport and news, so let's take a look. 
Peter G's been a friend of mine probably since the early 80s. It's so long ago, I can't really remember. But he's a very, very special human being. He's kind, he's funny, he's got a great sense of humour. Very well respected, of course, his knowledge of uh, sport is encyclopedic. And that wraps it up from the Esplanade in New Norfolk and the 1983 Australian Water Skiing Championships. Ah, greetings, Peter G for ABC Sport on the Move. Great work by the Australians, double gold. We were looking for a newsreader in the newsroom in Hobart and the EP at the time or head of news said to me, you got any ideas? And I said, yeah, I think I'd just the bloke. Good evening, Peter G with ABC News. Hello, I'm Peter G. Good evening, this is ABC News and I'm Peter G. Good evening, this is ABC News and I'm Peter G. way with him that seemed to endear him to everybody who either listened or watched him on television. It could be three days before rescue workers reach two men missing underground at the Beaconsfield gold mine in northern Tasmania. A very good morning everyone. Welcome to the Tasmanian component of today's Centenary of Anzac commemorations. Well Pete, congratulations on a magnificent career. You stepped into very big shoes at the outset when you took over my old job down in Hobart. And on behalf of me, congratulations on a fantastic career and I hope retirement serves you well. From France. I just wish him well and he's made a huge contribution to the ABC radio and television and he's a person to me what the ABC is all about. Have a very safe and happy retirement and once again it was a great pleasure to have worked with you and congratulations on your magnificent career. Sincere thanks on behalf of so many Tasmanians who have enjoyed having you in their homes each night and I want to wish you and your family the best in the next exciting chapter of your lives. I'm sure you probably called the start of my playing career so it's an honour to call the end of yours. Well done mate. There's something about Pete that's, well, very, very special. And I know just about everybody's going to miss him. You really are a very special bloke. We couldn't agree more, Pete. And we've got a little something for you. And this is Tasmanian wine, of oh, course. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Simon. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with you and your predecessors, Mike Pook and Jackie Brown. Uh, it's thanks and goodbye to all my wonderful colleagues here at the ABC. You're what makes this organisation so special and so vital to the daily life of our nation. It's been an honour to work with you all in all your capacities right across the corporation, but especially those in the newsroom. To my journalistic and production colleagues, thank you for giving me the privilege of presenting such a quality product, product each and every night for the past 20 years. To my family, some of them are in the control room now, I hope you're not going to get sick of me not going to work anymore. And to you, the audience, thank you for being so loyal and supportive during my time at the ABC. It's the relationship I've been allowed to build with you all that sustained me through the last 38 years. I know you'll give the same support to whoever sits in this chair after to me. You've always been classy Tasmania, stay that way. Good night and goodbye.
tonight.